All right. Um, it's noon, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar, Principles of Biological Control. My name is Lee Bridgman, and I'm an Ag and Horticulture Program Assistant in Queen Anne's County with the University of Maryland Extension. I will be facilitating the session. Throughout the presentation, we will be using the chat pod for questions, so please use the arrow key and select everyone. Type your question in, and the presentation presenter will answer your question as soon as they are able. Before we begin, I would like to thank our sponsors and collaborators listed on the slide on the screen. And also a reminder of our upcoming webinar on August 11th, which will be the basics of pond management. As a reminder, we are recording today. An email will be sent to you directly with the link and feel free to share the presenta archive presentation with colleagues and anyone else that you think might be interested. We have a complete collection of the archived webinars on our website, uh, also listed on the slide on the screen. Uh, I would like to now turn the presentation over to Alan Leslie to talk about principles of biological control. All right, the, uh, oh, there we go. All right, is my uh, screen working? Excellent. Thank you, Lee, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for joining me here today, this afternoon. Um, so today, it's going to be a broad overview of basic basics of biological control, mainly of insect pests. So there are biological control agents for all kinds of agricultural pests, but my background is in entomology, so uh, that's my preference to focus on insects. And really, there are some of the most successful biological control programs are, are with insect and other arthropod pests. So that's why we're going to focus on them. Um, so first, as an introduction, a kind of definition of what biological control is, it's essentially controlling any pest by using its natural enemies, so other uh, organisms that are, would naturally attack it in the environment. As, and that is as opposed to using synthetic uh, chemical pesticides. So there are agricultural and non-agricultural applications for biological control, uh, but we're going to obviously focus on the agricultural applications in this talk today. And as a simple outline of what I'm going to cover today, first we're going to review uh, what are the natural enemies. So we're going to talk about some of the different players in biological control. We're going to go over different types of biological control applications, the different forms that it can take. Now we're going to talk about some specific applications of biological control uh, using different examples of each of the, the types that we'll review. So to start off with, why would you consider using biological control as opposed to standard chemical insecticides to control a pest? So the first is uh, if you've got invasive species. So often invasive insect species are introduced to a new environment and become a problem partly because they come without their natural enemies. So that the parasites, the predators, the diseases that normally keep their populations in check are typically left behind in their native range and that allows them to explode in their new population. So introducing new uh, natural enemies to, can help combat invasive species. Another example is what's sometimes referred to as the pesticide treadmill. So the pesticide treadmill refers to the situation where you may have an insect pest, like in this diagram, uh, these aphids feeding on a crop, but you may also have some natural enemies that are helping to keep that pest uh, in check and keep it from exploding. If you use synthetic chemical insecticides and use something that's a broad spectrum uh, uh, insecticide, you're going to wipe out that pest population, but you're also going to wipe out the beneficial insects. And typically, the pest populations, the herbivorous insects, are going to rebound faster than those natural enemies. And so a lot of times you'll see these resurgences of different pest groups, and that locks you into using more chemical insecticides because you've wiped out any natural enemies and reduced any biological control that you're getting. <clears throat> 
third reason is insecticide resistance. So this is a relatively old graph here. It's like probably 30 years old now, but it's showing um, the, the number of different species that have evolved resistance, documented resistance to different classes of chemical insecticides uh, since their introduction. And it breaks it down by different groups, including pyrethroids, carbamates, and then the one black line at the top for total. And you can see this kind of exponential growth of uh, resistance among insect, insect, insect species. Uh, so biological control can be an alternative, especially for some of these groups that have become resistant to um, typical uh, chemistries. And to go along with this, there's relatively little uh, limited pesticide development. Uh, so the, the rate at which new active ingredients are coming out is not really keeping pace with the rate that insect species are developing resistance to those chemistries. And another reason is that chemical pesticides are just not effective on all insect groups. So as an example, this one here, this caterpillar feeding on this ear of corn, this is corn earworm, it's sheltered inside of the ear of corn and just physically protected from chemical insecticide sprays. And there's many other pests, leaf mining insects that live inside of leaf tissue, stem boring insects that live inside of the, the stems of plants. You just can't uh, hit them with chemical insecticides. So other methods incorporating biological control can help to keep these populations uh, in check. And finally, there's human and environmental health concerns of applying synthetic uh, insecticides and growing crops more sustainably with, with reduced inputs uh, is, is something that consumers are looking for. So now we'll get into some of the different players in biological control. And the first thing that comes to mind for most people are predators. So predators are simply uh, organisms that feed on other animals uh, to survive. And so they, they are beneficial in cropping systems because throughout their lifetime, a single predator will feed on multiple prey species. They're typically highly mobile. So this means that they can track pest populations and track outbreaks of pests. However, one of the drawbacks is that the reproduction for these predator species is typically not as fast as the pest species. So within a cropping season, you're not typically not going to get enough reproduction out of those predators to keep pace with an exploding pest population. And that's why you need these predators to, to move in and to colonize uh, the crop from other areas to be able to successfully suppress pests. Another drawback is that they may feed on one another. So some predators don't really distinguish between feeding on herbivorous insects and feeding on other predatory insects. So this is what's sometimes referred to as intragill predation. Um, and this kind of predator on predator violence can reduce the effectiveness of predator populations at suppressing pests. And another uh, quirk about predators is that they are often size dependent. So the prey that they will feed on uh, typically has to be of a specific size class. And that's because predators have to capture subdue and then consume their prey. So larger prey species can really only be handled by larger predator species and smaller prey species uh, you know, are often overlooked. They're not, um, they're not a good food resource. They're kind of a waste of time for those larger prey predator species. And so you need a diversity of predators to handle that diversity of, of pest species within a cropping environment. So some of the typical players among predators, um, so these are the different insect groups that, that make up the typical assemblage of predators in a cropping system. And the first are thrips. So there are many species of uh, thrips that are pests that feed on crops and cause crop damage, but there are also predatory thrips that feed on herbivorous thrips uh, and other small soft-bodied insects. Uh, and as an aside, as a kind of, uh, fun factoid. The term thrips is both singular and plural. So if you're ever talking about thrips, there's no such thing as a thrip. It would be a thrips or multiple thrips. It's all the same. 
The next are the true bugs in the order Hemiptera. This is the group that includes things like aphids and stink bugs, but there are also many beneficial predatory uh, insects that are true bugs, uh, such as this damsel bug. They all have the same characteristic of having piercing sucking mouth parts. So if you look closely at this guy on the screen here, his mouth part is like a long hypodermic syringe. And they can actually handle larger prey because instead of biting their prey to death, they actually stab them. Many of them will have toxins and then they liquefy the guts and, and suck them all up. Lacewings are another common predator in agriculture environments. Uh, the picture here is the a green lacewing. The adults really don't feed that much. Uh, it's the larvae, the immature stages, that are uh, the voracious predators. And many of them are very effective aphid predators. Next are beetles. So all life stages of, of beetles can be uh, predatory. So you can have larvae uh, and adult beetles that, that provide bio, biological control. There are predatory flies uh, that are effective predators, such as this robber fly. And ants and wasps in the order Hymenoptera are also uh, very effective predators and very common in cropping systems. Now, as for predators that are non-insects, this is really two major groups. The first are spiders, and spiders are just kind of the quintessential generalist, uh, especially web-building spiders. They'll feed on anything they come across. Uh, they have a wide range of hunting strategies from web-building to ambush predators, uh, and they can even have what are called non-consumptive effects. So uh, scientists have documented that just the presence of spiders in the environment can sometimes repel pest insects. And that's because they leave behind silk and other chemical cues wherever they're traveling. And some insect species can actually detect that. They know that there's a spider around and then they avoid that plant. The other major group of non-insect predators are predatory mites. And um, these guys are, are very good natural controls of especially spider mite populations. And this is one group of biological control agents that's been studied for a relatively long, long period. And you can buy them uh, commercially, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Next group of biological control agents are the parasitoids. So parasitoids differ from parasites in that they have a single host during their life, lifespan, and it's always killed. So parasites sometimes do not kill their hosts, but parasitoids always kill their hosts. So parasitoids can attack all different life stages of pest insect species. And as an example, what we have here, this is a cluster of stink bug eggs. So it's a stink bug egg mass. Sitting on top of it is actually a tiny, uh, parasitic wasp. And what she's doing is she's laying her eggs inside of those stink bug eggs. So then those eggs hatch, the larva will attack and consume that developing stink bug embryo. And then instead of having baby stink bugs hatching, you get another generation of wasps coming out of that egg. So that wasp killed its host. Its host in this case was a stink bug uh, in the egg stage, and that's the only prey that it will kill during its entire life cycle. It's the next generation that will kill the next batch of stink bugs. We can compare that to this tachinid fly. This is a brush-legged fly. You can uh, see it gets its name from this fringe of hairs on the hind legs. They are parasitoids that attack leaf-footed bugs and squash bugs, but they attack the late nymph stages and adult stages. And they, and you can see in the circle, they lay their eggs on the outside of the squash bug's body, right up here near the head. The larva will hatch out of that egg, burrow into the thorax of the squash bug, and they feed on the guts, they feed on the internals of squash bugs, eventually kill it, and eventually another adult fly will emerge. But during that whole time period, it's already developed to the late nymph stage or the adult stage so it's already fed on the crop it's already caused some damage and it may in some cases have even reproduced by the time it gets parasitized so 
In general, parasitoids that attack earlier stages of a pest are more effective biological control agents than those that attack later stages of pests. So among these species, they can be specialists, they can only attack a single uh, prey species, or they may be generalists. They may be able to attack a wide range of hosts across multiple species and even multiple insect orders. But in general, all parasitoids belong to one of two insect orders. Generally, they're all either going to be a wasp or a type of fly. There are a few oddball species out there of beetles and moths that are also parasitoids, uh, but they're really fairly rare and uh, not really relevant in terms of biological control for cropping systems. The next category are uh, pathogens or uh, microscopic organisms that uh, infect uh, pest insects. And we can break that down into a few different uh, pathogen groups. The first are bacterial pathogens. Um, probably the most successful uh, among them, or the most widely used among them, is a bacterial species called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's also sometimes just called BT for short. There's been around 65 different subspecies of BT that have been isolated and identified in the lab. And among these subspecies, there are different groups that produce different proteins that are toxic to different insect groups. Um, so the target pests feed on spores of BT and the spores are a resting stage. Those spores produce specific proteins that are gut toxins. So when they're consumed by different insects, they penetrate the gut wall and they cause sepsis in the insect and the insect eventually dies. And the different subspecies, some will produce proteins that only attack or only are effective against caterpillars. Some will produce proteins that are only effective against flies and some produce proteins that are only effective against beetles. So depending on which type of spores you have, you can get some very, uh, some, some insect, basically insecticidal uh, material that's very uh, specific in what it's going to target. So one of the most common uh, applications of this one is a chemical called Dipel. This one is probably the most widely used uh, BT product on the market. It's active against caterpillars and you basically apply it as you would any other synthetic, synthetic uh, insecticide you mix it up in a spray tank, you spray it over the crops. You need relatively good coverage because again, the, the target species has to consume those spores before they get intoxicated, before they die. And in general, it works best against smaller larvae because they're more susceptible to that toxin. This is the same technology. These are the same genes that have been isolated and introduced to transgenic crops like BT corn and BT cotton. Uh, so it's a, it's a group that's very widely studied and, and the insecticidal properties of, of BT are, are very well known and, and very widely applied. And so it's probably one of the most successful um, bacterial biological control agents on the market. The next example are viral pathogens. So these tend to all be baculoviruses and this entire group is really insect specific. So there's no chance of these viruses ever infecting humans. Uh, we've got enough virus problems of our own. They're very effective, but there are few commercial successes, and that's because the viral pathogens tend to be two species specific. So with, with the bacterial pathogen with BT, you might kill a broad range of just caterpillars, but with viral pathogens, it tends to be only a single species that it targets. So that single species has to be a very high economic concern and there has to be relatively few other cheaper chemical insecticides available uh, for it to be commercially viable. So among some of the few commercial successes is one um, baculovirus that targets uh, coddling moth. So uh, especially within organic apples this is one that has found foothold that, that has turned out to be economically viable. Then there are fungal pathogens. Uh, there are many successful species among fungal pathogens. 
these uh, entomopathogenic fungi are, are pretty well known. They're pretty, pretty good diversity of them. Uh, some of them have a relatively broad host range. You can kill plenty of pest insects with them. Others have a very limited host range. So again, you may only be targeting a single species or a handful of species within the same family. Uh, but one of the drawbacks with fungal pathogens is that you need to get the material on the insect's cuticle because these pathogens, they, they are stored as a, 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 again, as a spore, as a resting stage. They land on the insect's uh, body and then they need to essentially germinate almost like a plant. They grow into the insect's cuticle and then infect uh, the insect from the outside, eventually killing it. But in order for them to work, you need really good coverage. So you actually need to get the material on the insect and then you need the right environmental conditions for that fungal pathogen to grow and to infect your target pest. So there are a couple of um, more robust fungal species that have been uh, successfully used as biological insecticides, like this one, Botanigard. Uh, but in general, they're they're not as widely used as some of the other, uh, as some as as for example as Dipel. And then there are nematodes. So nematodes are microscopic roundworms. Uh, most of the ones that are going to target insects, the entomopathogenic nematodes are in either Steiner nema or heterorhabditis, those two genera. They have a relatively broad host range. So these nematodes don't care what type of insect you are. As long as you've got a soft, flexible cuticle that they can penetrate, they're going to infect you. But the problem is they need moist conditions. So as tiny little roundworms, they basically need a thin film of water to swim across to get to their host. So they work relatively well in the soil because soil tends to retain moisture and there tends to be enough water in moist soil environments for them to move around and find a host and colonize it. So think of soil dwelling uh, insect larvae that have nice soft bodies and are uh, delicious for, for these little nematodes. Uh, and also in greenhouses. So greenhouses, especially if they're, they're raising any kind of tropical plants or have a very high humidity environment, uh, you can potentially get them to work in, on, in foliar systems in greenhouses. So here's an example of how these uh, nematodes work. They find a host, um, they penetrate the cuticle, they reproduce like crazy, consuming the internals of, of whatever that larva is, uh, and then they get to the point where they rupture the host completely and they all explode out of it, um, and then they fan out in search of, of new prey. So these work really well because you can get the populations to be kind of self-sustaining. You can get the populations to grow because uh, they reproduce effectively as a part of how they kill their host. You just have to maintain the correct environmental conditions to keep them alive. So those are the main uh, players in biological control. Next, we're going to talk about some of the different types of biological control or the way that that biological control can be applied. The first uh, is classical biological control. So essentially, classical biological control is just reassociating introduced species with their natural enemies. So as we mentioned before, when you when you have invasive species, when you have introduced species to a new environment, typically they show up without their natural enemies. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why their populations explode. Classical biological control is meant to be a kind of permanent solution or a large area-wide pest suppression when you have these unintentional introductions of, of pest species. So ideally, um, the, the, the best biological control agents under classical biological control would have high levels of control of your your target pest and fast reproduction because you don't want to have to introduce all of the natural enemies. You really want to go back to their native environment and find what is the best, what is the one species that provides the highest mortality of, of this pest. We don't want to introduce too many more species to its introduced range. We just want to get as much control and as much mortality as possible. 
So as an example of that, this is a stink bug. This is a brown marmorated stink bug. It's a species that was introduced to the United States back in 2004. Uh, and since then, its populations kind of exploded. It became a major agricultural pest, especially of fruit crops, because it feeds directly on the fruit, causing, um, causing damage that makes the fruit uh, unmarketable. Part of the reason it, it was able to explode is because the native parasitoids, the native predators, didn't recognize it as a prey species, and so its populations were able to grow very fast. So scientists went back to its native range and found this one parasitoid species, Trisulcus japonicus, uh, or TJ for short. It's also sometimes called the samurai fly or samurai wasp. Uh, as in the previous example, it targets the uh, egg masses of the stink bug, of, of the brown marmorated stink bug. It lays its eggs inside of uh, the stink bug's eggs and outhatch more of this wasp. And so by targeting that egg stage again, you get really good control of this pest because you're wiping out a whole generation before it's able to hatch, before it's able to feed or cause any damage. Uh, unfortunately, before <laughs> the researchers could release it in the new environment, they actually found this species present in the United States. So somehow it already got introduced. Uh, and right now they're, they're still introducing it to new populations and they have a, a major program in place to monitor the effectiveness of this insect and to see um, if it's worth all the time and money that's been invested. And this is a very intensive process. So going back to the native range, identifying what species are causing the high, highest mortality. You have to bring them back, uh, make sure that you can raise them in the lab to, to numbers that are high enough to release enough in the environment to make a difference. And then you have to, to monitor it to make sure that this program is actually working, see if it's effectively reducing the stink bug population. It costs a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer money, it takes a lot of time, it's a lot of effort, but the idea, the, the rationale behind this is that this is safer than really widespread chemical control. So this is eventually going to provide a long-term area-wide pest management solution uh, that's much safer than repeatedly applying a lot of insecticides across a large area. So, uh, One of the potential pitfalls of class, classical biological control are what are called non-target effects. So what's very important when you're introducing one of these new biocontrol agents is that it has good specificity for hosts, that it's really only going to attack the pest that you're interested in controlling. So the main criteria when, when introducing predators and parasitoids, like in the previous example, is A, that they do not target humans, which in general, you can be relatively uh, safe in assuming that these small parasitic wasps aren't going to attack humans. Uh, but second, that they do not attack any beneficial species. And these are the roughly the criteria that, that researchers uh, have to meet before they can introduce new species uh, into a new environment. But there are risks. So there has to be uh, a trade-off between the risks of introducing a new species to a new environment, uh, because it's, it, there's a certain level of unpredictability whenever you're introducing a species to a food web. You can't always predict exactly how it's going to interact with that new environment and if it is going to have the intended effect uh, that, that you want. So one of the classical examples of this classical biological control gone wrong is the introduction of cane toads uh, in Australia to control grayback, grayback cane beetles and sugar cane. So in, in other environments, these toads fed very well on beetle pests, but they didn't do enough research to see whether or not cane toads were foraging in the right place at the right time when these beetles would be active. The cane toads have a very wide uh, a very wide host range, so they'll feed on a whole lot of different insects and amphibians. And they ended up becoming a major pest in Australia. And it tends to, this tends to happen uh, in more fragile ecosystems. So 
smaller isolated ecosystems, especially island habitats like Hawaii and like uh, Australia, um, are more prone to have their food webs disturbed by different introductions. And so more work is needed to, to guarantee that a classical biological control introduction isn't going to cause more problems than it, than it intends to fix. So some of the other uh, types of biological control include augmentive releases. So these are augmentive releases are, are essentially limited to agricultural production. So these are kind of analogous to uh, a pesticide application where you have a pest population, you would spray a whole bunch of chemical to knock down that pest population and protect your crop. Augmentive releases are you have a pest population, you release a whole bunch of biological control agents to knock down that population and protect that crop, but really only for that cropping season. And within, uh, so you only get single season pest suppression. You're not really getting a, a new sustaining uh, beneficial insect population. You're not gonna have carryover effects in multiple, multiple cropping years. And augmentative releases can really take two different forms. The first are inundative releases where you're trying to get rapid pest suppression. Uh, you don't need any reproduction from whatever biological control agent that you're releasing. And this, as I mentioned before, is similar to that pesticide application. You're just putting down everything you need to knock down that pest population, keep it under thresholds, and to, to maintain uh, a healthy crop. We compare that to what are called inoculative releases, where it's a little bit longer term and self-sustaining within one cropping season. So it's just adding beneficials to an area where those species don't persist. Uh, and a good example of that are greenhouses. So if you have this kind of controlled environment where a pest population shows up, you may not have any beneficial insects just because nothing can get in that greenhouse. There's no natural uh, dispersal into that greenhouse. So you add beneficial insects, you add those biological control agents. They may uh, persist within one cropping season but then as soon as you pull those plants out, as soon as you empty the greenhouse, everything's going to die off anyway. So it's not going to be maintained in any kind of permanent way. So as another example of these inoculative releases, this is a eulophid wasp, another parasitoid called Pediobius foveolata. It attacks Mexican bean beetle uh, larvae and pupae. Uh, so this Mexican bean beetle larva in this picture here is brown. They should be bright yellow. Uh, but the brown ones indicate that they've been parasitized by this wasp. So inside this larva's body are a whole bunch of wasp larvae that are eventually going to complete their development and emerge as adult wasps. But Pediobius doesn't survive uh, the cold winters in Maryland. So although it will successfully reproduce uh, throughout one cropping season and give effective control of Mexican bean beetle, it needs to be reintroduced, re-inoculated every year. So it's another example of an augmentative release. And these kinds of, of biological control essentially require mass rearing of whatever species. So if you're going to release a whole lot of a biological control agent, you need to be able to go online or call up a company and just buy a whole bunch all at once. So it's only really amenable to certain species that you can raise in a lab, you can raise in an insectary at an affordable rate for farmers to release in their, their fields and greenhouses. And then there's pathogens as biopesticides. So we already talked about some of the different uh, microbial uh, groups that are effective as uh, biological control agents. This is also considered a form of inundative release. So you're essentially introducing enough of whatever pathogen that you're using to cause a mini epidemic among your pest species and knock them out. But you don't need that pathogen necessarily reproducing. So this kind of application is much more easily adopted into more conventional uh, spray programs because a lot of these materials just get mixed up and applied in a sprayer like you would any other synthetic pesticide. 
Um, many of them are shelf stable, so especially the spore stages of some of the microbial species or the fungal species, they might be able to sit on the shelf for a couple of years before you have to apply them. Um, and so they're, they're, they're easier to, to work into standard rotations and to work into uh, a larger scale pest control program. So the biopesticides, these pathogens are all regulated by EPA, similar to synthetic chemical insecticides with the exception of nematodes. Nematodes are not regulated the same as other, um, other pathogens. Now, EPA requires toxicity tests and residue tests as a part of the registration of new chemical insecticides. And these tests alone can cost companies upwards of $10 million to bring a new material onto the market. So EPA recognizes that a lot of these insect specific pathogens aren't necessarily a high risk for human health. So they've really reduced the extent of the toxicity tests that are required for things like fungal pathogens or microbial pathogens. And so it might cost on the order of a quarter to half a million dollars to bring uh, new biopesticides to market. And this partly incentivizes these safer chemicals or safer, safer alternatives uh, to, to chemical insecticides. Um, and also just really allows some of these uh, chemistries to, to be economically feasible. However, as we mentioned before, there's still some drawbacks. So it still can be cost prohibitive for certain niche markets if they don't have um, a high, wide enough activity against enough pests. And in some cases, some of these materials uh, may have pesticidal effects, but they may not be making these claims in their marketing and they may have other benefits to, to, to protecting crops or, or other crop benefits and may be marketed simula simply as biostimulants and avoid EPA registration altogether. So another type of biological control is what's known as conservation biological control. So this is essentially making crop fields more hospitable for the naturally occurring population of beneficial insects. So there are a few different barriers that may uh, limit the effectiveness of the natural population of predators and, and parasitoids from suppressing pest populations. So the first is an unsuitable crop variety. So in this picture here, this is a tomato plant. There's certain crops, especially tomatoes, that are very hairy, they're very resinous. They might have glandular trichomes. These are all adaptations meant to limit the movement of herbivorous insects across the plant to make it really difficult for pests to crawl up stems. But in effect, they can also limit how well beneficial insects can move around the plant and can actually track their prey. Unsuitable field environment. So especially in environments that are very tillage intensive, um, you know, this, these kinds of environments aren't going to maintain beneficial insects from one season to another. There's not a whole lot of predators and parasitoids that can survive a tilled field, especially over, over large acreage. Inadequate nutrition. So although these, these predator, well, especially parasitoid species, although parasitoids are attacking um, the, the pest insects, the adult stages often will need to feed on nectar and pollen to maintain their energy levels. So in this picture, this is a tachinid wasp. That's a parasitoid of caterpillars and other insects. Um, but the adults live longer, they reproduce better, and they're, they're more efficient at finding prey if they have good floral resources, that nectar for energy and, and pollen as a protein source. And also an inadequate source of natural enemies. So in Maryland, we're kind of uh, lucky because we really have a, we tend to have a modeled landscape of a mix of agricultural and um, non-crop forested lands. So there's really good uh, natural and semi-natural environment as a source of natural enemies to move into 
agricultural fields that would otherwise be inhospitable to beneficial insects. But there's other parts of the country and other parts of the world where agriculture means farming <laughs> across the entire board and there's not as many of these sources for beneficial insects. And finally, pesticide use. So many of the beneficial insects that we've, we've described uh, will simply be knocked out by synthetic chemical pesticides. And so if you're targeting multiple different uh, insect pests at the same time, and some of them have to be controlled by chemical insecticides, you may get non-target effects where you're harming your, uh, harming your natural enemies at the same time. <clears throat> so there is a case though for using chemical insecticides. So in certain instances, uh, biological control is never going to provide enough control of a certain pest to re completely replace chemical insecticides. So the first example of that is controlling vectors of human disease. So there's essentially zero tolerance for uh, insects and other arthropod pests that carry human disease because we don't want any of it in the environment at all. Next is eradicating invasive species. So especially if they've only recently been introduced, uh, chemical insecticides can be a very useful tool for completely wiping out these founding populations and keeping them from getting out of control. The next are vectors of crop disease. So similar to vectors of human disease within a cropping system, uh, something like this striped cucumber beetle, although at very low densities, they may not cause that much feeding damage. They transmit uh, Erwinia, which causes uh, bacterial wilt in cucurbits. So you don't want any striped cucumber beetles in a cucurbit field, especially early in the season, because that disease that they transmit can wipe out an entire crop, even if they're not causing that much feeding damage. And then finally, pests that feed directly to uh, fruits or vegetables or will infest fruits or vegetables. There's very low tolerances, especially in fruit and vegetable crops, for contamination of ear feeding pests like corn earworm. Or in this example, this is spotted wing drosophila, which lays its eggs inside of small fruit. Um, so things that directly attack the fruit, there's generally a very low tolerance for those pests and biological control tends to not completely wipe out pest populations. So in general, they're not going to provide uh, sufficient control. However, these chemical insecticides can be good backups for biological control. If you don't have effective season long control of your pests using natural enemies, and they can also help to complement biological control. So you can knock down populations initially, with chemical insecticides, and then introduce some of these natural enemies to keep those populations under your desired threshold. So you can limit the, the need for, for further insecticide applications. So now we're gonna go over um, quickly, <laughs> quickly go over some examples of different applications of, of where biological control can work effectively. And the first is in greenhouses or high tunnels or really confined growing areas. So some of the earliest applications of these augmentative releases were done in these kinds of controlled environments. And that's because high tunnels and greenhouses limit the amount of, um, li limit the amount of dispersal, li limit the amount of colonization by, by different pest and beneficial insects. So you have a limited kind of food web you're dealing with. You have a controlled environment, so there's there's fewer impacts of um, weather and temperature extremes that can can affect what's going to happen. Some of the first early early successes were the parasitic wasp Encarcia formosa on uh, controlling white fly infestations, the predatory mite uh, Phytoceulus persimilis attacking spider mites in greenhouses. And since then, there's now over 100 different species that are available that can attack uh, different specific pest species under different growing conditions. And most of them work very well in these greenhouse or high tunnel environments. So among 
these groups, there are different parasitoids that will attack aphids, leaf miners, and white flies. Predatory mites that attack, you know, every different type of uh, herbivorous mite. And different predatory insects that will attack uh, aphids, mealybugs, mites. These are kind of generalists that kind of broadly attack a lot of different small herbivorous pest species. And then nematodes. Again, as I mentioned before, these greenhouses, especially if you can maintain a high uh, humidity, are the optimum environment for uh, parasitic nematodes. So in outdoor releases, uh, there are much more complex habitat than greenhouses. So there's more competing factors. There's other uh, predatory, there's other prey insects involved. You have the environment to deal with, which is much more unpredictable than inside a controlled growing environment. So you don't tend to get as pronounced an effect from augmentative releases in outdoor settings. But some of the more effective ones um, include Parasitoids, so as an example, this is trichogramma that attacks coddling moth eggs. So egg uh, parasitic wasps that attack eggs. Again, you're attacking that early life stage and you're really limiting the amount of damage that, that can occur from that generation. Uh, predatory mites, uh, a lot of those mites that are effective in high tunnels and greenhouses are also effective in field settings. You just have to release many more usually orders of magnitude more to see the same effect. And then generalist predators. So some of the same predators like uh, the ladybugs, hippodamia convergens and harmonia axiridis and green lacewing larvae, they'll work in outdoor settings too, but again you need much larger starting populations and it also helps to introduce these things way ahead of pest pressure to keep pests below threshold and not necessarily, they're not, they're less effective at knocking down pest populations once they get out of control. So some of the things you need to consider uh, for outdoor releases, outdoor releases are the application costs. So unlike those biopesticides, a lot of the insect, um, beneficial insects need to be hand applied. So there's a labor component involved. Uh, some of them are in, in uh, enclosed in these sachets, so it's a kind of slow release. They're, they're a, a, a better method of releasing some of these beneficials because it's a, an environment that can sustain, um, in this case, the mites, until they're able to disperse on their own. So instead of just dumping them out and hoping for the best, they're, they're somewhat sheltered in these sachets. Um, you have to consider what level of efficacy that you need to maintain and your compatibility with other spray programs. If you have to spray, uh, you know, pyrethroids to control stink bugs and you also have a spider mite population, you're going to wipe out any beneficial mites that you have introduced. So if you're already spraying for other pests, then uh, these kind of outdoor releases may not be compatible with, with whatever pest management program that you already have in place. There are some exceptions though. Uh, so there's been some breeding of predatory mites that are resistant to some pesticide groups. And finally, you need to consider the cost relative to chemical controls and just the complexity of these multi-species control programs. Uh, if you've got multiple prey that are multiple pests that you need to control, and you have to do multiple releases of different species to target each one, things can get out of hand relatively quickly. An alternative to these augmentative releases is what's called conservation biological control. Uh, and it's just changing that unsuitable environment to be more hospitable to your native or natural uh, pest, uh, natural enemy population. So, Addressing situations like unsuitable environment, inadequate nutrition, and altering pesticide use to make the cropping environment more hospitable to those beneficial insects. Um, we'll start with unsuitable environment. So a lot of annual fruit and vegetable production is very tillage intensive. There's a lot of turnover uh, and in between there may be 
periods where it's kept as bare ground or there may be a lot of bare ground between plants. And that bare ground alone can just be a dispersal limitation for a lot of beneficial insects. They just don't like going across bare ground. They only want to travel across plant material. So there's been some work done with what are called living mulches. So keeping living green uh, plant material on the field in between the crop rows so that the entire field is planted in, in some kind of crop can make it a more hospitable environment to beneficial insects. Can also provide alternative prey, a physical refuge, and again, can enhance mobility as they're able to travel across that uh, completely planted area. Next is inadequate nutrition. So generally this means adding more floral resources to the landscape to support those parasitic species. So experiments that we've done have tested clovers, buckwheat, partridge pea, and marigold, either interplanted or planted as flowering border strips to just bring more pollen and more nectar into the environment to support those parasitic wasps and flies. And third is pesticide use. So this list is an example of a, a recommended spray program for controlling spotted wing drosophila and blueberries. And so among this list are pyrethroids, organophosphates, and carbamates, which are all very broad spectrum chemicals. But there's also spinosins and diamides. So generally, whenever you're choosing an insecticide to spray for, for a pest, there are going to be some that are very broad spectrum and some that are going to be some options that are going to be a little bit lighter a little bit softer on beneficial insects. So things like spinosins, diamides, and oxidiazines tend to be more species specific. They tend to conserve more of the natural enemies. And if you do have to spray something that's more broad spectrum, it's best to wait till the end of the season. And that limits the potential for outbreaks of pests later on because you've knocked out a lot of the natural enemies. Oh, and neonicotinoids can work too, as long as they're applied as a soil trench and not as a foliar application. So in summary, uh, gone a little bit long, but we'll wrap this up. Uh, biological control is not going to be a silver bullet, but it will, and it can be uh, an essential component of an integrated pest management program. So it can be incorporated alongside those chemical controls, cultural and mechanical controls that you're using to limit your pest population. It's definitely not going to replace everything and it's not going to work in every situation, um, but it's something that's ever evolving and something that can be, typically can be incorporated at least to some extent in most cropping, uh, cropping systems. And so specific adaptation or applications are always going to be context dependent. You know, we're dealing with living organisms that need a specific environment to survive and feed and reproduce and be successful. And so in general, incorporating biological control in any specific application is, have, is going to have to involve at least some degree of experimentation on the farm, trying different species, trying different releases and seeing what, what will work in your specific application. And so with that, I've got maybe a couple of minutes. Um, I'll take any questions anyone might have. It looks like you've got a question in the um, chat um, from Hannah. Uh, what about crop rotation? Is it effective for confusing pests? What if you were working in a small area about an acre? So, so crop rotation is, is really one of the probably the foundational <laughs> cultural practice that you can use for, for, for pest management. There's, there's probably no better way of, of controlling really a, a broad range, fungal, bacterial, insect, and weed pests. I mean, uh, if you're not doing anything else, you should be doing crop rotation. Obviously, it's, it's, it's difficult to do in uh, smaller acreage. You can't move crops very far away from each other. Uh, but if you can, I mean, if you can even do it through time, if you can alternate what you're growing any particular year, obviously markets demand certain things all the time. And those are the things you're gonna have to prioritize moving around as much as you can. But if you can grow some crops in one year and alternate 
uh, to a different crop the next year, um, then that will kind of maximize the amount of rotation you can do under smaller smaller acreage. <clears throat> Okay, another question. What would you recommend for stink bugs in the home? Stink bugs in the home? Well, <laughs> uh, really the most effective practice for stink bugs in the home is finding the cracks where they're getting in and just sealing them up as best as possible. So uh, the stink bugs that get into the home are that, that brown marmorated stink bug species. They just have this um, Characteristic where they find shelter, they overwinter as adults. So in, in the wild, they're under tree bark, they're in cracks in trees, they're in caves and cracks under rocks. And our houses look very similar to that environment to them. So they do their best to find any openings that they can find around doors, windows, everything. So if you can, if you can find which cracks they're getting into and seal them up as best as possible, that's really that's really the only effective thing you can do. There's not a whole lot you can do to manage them once they get in other than vacuuming them up because they're not very active. So they're not going to, um, they're not going to feed. They're not going to move around until it's time for them to leave. And by then it's too late. So prevention is the best, best method for that one. <clears throat> all right, great. Um, looks like uh, that's all the questions we have right now. So, uh, that was very good and informative. So I thank you so much for talking to us. Is there right. anybody any questions? Get them in real quick. Okay. All right. Well, everyone have a great day and look for the, you'll get an email with the recordings, but I also posted the link for looking at recordings online to earlier webinars. And then this one will eventually be up there. So have a nice day. Thanks right. guys. Thank you.